All right, now let's get into the physiology. Um, and this is where some of the most interesting uh, modern neuroscience is happening. So let's talk numbers. So we have about 10 billion neurons in our cerebral cortex. What does this tell us about processing? Well, we want to know what it's processing language is to understand that. It's not enough to just know how many neurons. So neurons communicate with these things. These are uh, called action potentials, uh, also known as uh, spikes. Um, and they have about 100 millivolt amplitude. They last for about a millisecond or two. Uh, and they travel uh, very rapidly along the axon. Uh, and when they hit the nerve terminal, they trigger release of neurotransmitter. They have chemical information onto the next cell. Now, uh, they can appear uh, to operate at very high rates. So you can have, uh, you know, time scale here, 50 milliseconds. They can come at about one per millisecond uh, in the optimal case. And so you could have, you know, up to 1,000 pulses per second. Depending on how you think about it, this could give you a indication of upper bounds on uh, processing speed. You could end up with numbers like uh, you know, 10,000 gigahertz in cortex. Um, but what's interesting is modern computers are already easily, you know, in this uh, and, and so it's, and yet they can't do the kind of processing that the brain does. So it doesn't give us a deep enough understanding of the computational capabilities of the brain, but it's a nice uh, way to, to quantitatively uh, frame the problem and look at the uh, upper bounds of what the capabilities might be. Uh, by the way, Spike Train also appears to be a Japanese punk band of some kind, so don't get confused if there's an alternative uh, article you're reading. So then let's think about uh, uh, energy, uh, and what's amazing about the brain is the low energy uh, requirement that it takes. So very powerful computers, the, you know, the one that beat Gary Kasparov and uh, chess, uh, uh, a number of years back, used vastly more energy than he used. It did end up beating him, but it was a little bit close. Um, and so let's think about uh, where the power savings might come in. Where is the power utilized in the, in the brain? Most of that happens here at the synapses. These are the connections between neurons. The spikes or action potentials that we talked about, they come barreling down and they hit this presynaptic terminal. The fact that you're having a membrane voltage deflection there opens channels, ion channels that are voltage dependent, calcium channels. Calcium comes in, allows vesicles containing neurotransmitter to freeze with this presynaptic membrane, and those transmitters leak out into the cleft rapidly across this very narrow uh, 40 nanometer or so cleft. Hit uh, uh, receptors on the postsynaptic side and open them and flow, and that triggers electrical events in the postsynaptic cell. Very fast process, but all these movements of ions down their electrochemical gradients then have to be restored. And so you've got very active pumps that are restoring those gradients at the same time as they're being run down by the communication. So that's where most of the energy is used. It's used uh, at, at synapses. So right away you can see there's some cost there, and that also tells us how important the synapses are. If if you could just do away with the synapse and just have the, the spike just barrel on to the next neuron, that would seem faster, a heck of a lot simpler, probably less energetically costly, and yet we use this chemical synapse. And so why, why is that done? Well, a major hypothesis is that it's done this way to allow information storage. This is something that's tunable. You can tune the weight or gain of, of a synapse by adjusting any of these parameters, you could stick more ion channels in the postsynaptic membrane, have more vesicles in the presynaptic membrane, or you could affect their likelihood of release. All these things are actually have been shown in one way or another to actually happen, especially in structures like the hippocampus. So you're giving up a lot. You're giving up a lot uh, in energy and speed and complexity, but you could store information there. So we're going to uh, upload papers for you to read that uh, look at processes like LTP and LTD, long-term potentiation and long-term depression, which are these gain changes that happen. In, in, in. Okay, so what kind of storage capability are we talking about here? Well, you know, again, you get to somewhat uh, 
uh, paltry numbers, uh, you know, if you think that you could store a bit per synapse, you don't get more than about 10,000 uh, gigabytes even across the entire cortex. And again, computers are, are not that far off. Maybe there's other sites of information storage that are less well accepted or understood. People talk about storing information biochemically in gene expression uh, networks or maybe in patterns of excitability of cells. But this is by far the dominant paradigm. It's very theoretically tractable uh, and we can see things like that actually uh, happening in uh, the brains of, of, of <coughs> Now people have tried to actually think about how much information actually is stored in the human brain. And, and I don't believe this sort of thing, but just to give you, it's a, that there are people out there in psychology and in uh, telecommunications that are interested in thinking about this sort of thing. And so they've tried to estimate the total amount of stored information <clears throat> uh, averaged over 70 years and calculated that there might be an input rate over those 70 years from reading of about one bit per second, uh, picture recognition, uh, uh, basic information about the world, uh, word knowledge. And they end up with sort of a, a, a gigabit a range, multiple gigabit range, which again is not that much. Um, I, I, the methods are suspect, but it's an interesting thing. To... This is a, a more, uh, <clears throat> I think, important theoretical uh, framework that, uh, that you should know about as, as bioengineers. There's a very influential uh, paper uh, from a guy named John Hopfield now at Princeton who uh, came up with a computational model for how memory might be stored using synaptic strength or gain modification. And so the basic idea that he had was the following. Let's consider uh, neurons as being units that could be either active or inactive. If I color in two neurons, they might be active. And that is a brain state. That is uh, when your brain is experiencing a memory and you're in a, uh, what might be a unitary state of consciousness about something like remembering your grandmother's kitchen and the smell of something like uh, cookies, okay? And that, nobody knows if that's what a brain state is, by the way, or, or that's what the recall of memory is, but that's reasonable. Let's think about that. So some neurons being active being inactive in a specific way. And so, and these neurons, they're of course connected with, uh, as many neurons do. Okay, and let's call these neurons, so that there are different uh, states. So here's one state, this is state uh, E. Uh, uh, and there are uh, different neurons, neurons I and J. Let's call this one I. And there's a synaptic strength between these neurons, okay? And this <coughs> synaptic strength, <coughs> you could call T I J, so that's the gain of the synapse between one neuron and another. Okay. So there's two aspects to this model. There's the dynamics and there's the information storage. First question is, what are its dynamics? How do you think about it playing out over time, the neural activity playing out over time? Well. Let's, let's think about what happens if you only have a partial sensory stimulus. What if <clears throat> you're somewhere else, you're not in the kitchen, you're, it's 20 years later and you smell a chocolate chip cookie somewhere. Now that's only part of the memory, but somehow that can, as we all know, that can call back the full memory and it can bring you back to that full state. So maybe we have to design our model where a partial memory can recreate a full memory. How could you do that? You could do that if this neuron and this neuron were strongly connected with each other. If the fact that they co-occurred in an important way in the past, if that strengthened their synapse, and so that way when you only had one active, it would tend to recruit the other one and it would cause the memory to come back. Okay, so all we need for that to work then is we need a, a, a storage rule such that when two neurons are active at the same time, the synaptic strength gets more powerful. Okay, so that is the information storage prescription, which is shown here, straight from the paper. Um, and, and if you actually look at it, if both, if you assign a binary value, if both neurons are on, assign a value of one to both of them. Uh, and that gives us a value of one here, 
here, and while you're experiencing the state for the first time, you're going to increment your synaptic strength by one because both are on, the, on together. Uh, if they're both off together, actually that's also going to be predictive as suggested. It should be strengthened as well. You'll have a minus one times a minus one. Uh, so that will give us a plus one and we're going to increment our strength. So it doesn't matter on together or off together. That ends up indicating these neurons should follow each other in the future. But if they're different, uh, then you end up not incrementing strength. Okay. Then uh, uh, you don't end up with a positive uh, increment in this. So that's the storage prescription. And this very simple thing, this is sometimes called a Hebb rule. Uh, it is similar to something that a guy named Donald Hebb uh, put forth in the 1940s. But we see this in the LTP and LTD synaptic physiology. If you stimulate two neurons at the same time in the hippocampus and the cortex, synaptic strength between them will get stronger. And so that we know this sort of process is playing out in the brain. And that's what's driven so much of the interest is we know that these rules are, are present. We don't know that they're used in the way that we hypothesize, but we know that they're used. And once you set up your synaptic strengths that way, then that makes the dynamics uh, happen appropriately because then exactly this plays out. Uh, this is now the dynamics rule, and if you sum across all the incoming uh, activity states in a, in a brain, the different neurons that could be coming into a, to a particular neuron, and if the neuron has to be above a threshold to fire, to be active, a threshold that you could call U, and if the synaptic strengths tend to be uh, uh, high enough, that neuron will fire, uh, and that gives us exactly the sort of dynamics that we need to get what's called associated memory recall. So that is a very, it's a simple thing. Uh, it's maybe more complex than we'd like, but it's still simple relative uh, to the brain. But it does have some very interesting uh, predictive, cap predictive capability, and it corresponds to things that we see in biology. And this capital N here, that's the number of neurons in the network, and you can store stably uh, up to about 0.15 N memories in the network. And so that's kind of interesting. It's not. Uh, the number of synapses, it's the number of neurons, and maybe that indicates why the total information storage that the brain may have is less than we would think by looking at synapses, even though uh, the synapses are used as part of the information storage mechanism. So that is Hebbian plasticity. Uh, it could be impaired in disease states, it could be enhanced, uh, but it's a major uh, theoretical construct to understand uh, learning and memory happen. Now, um, there's no question that more neurons, based in part on the Hopfield model, but also based on intuitive understanding, you should be able to store more information the uh, larger your brain gets, and you should be able to plan and carry out more complex tasks. And you know, we can see genome size hasn't changed too much in, in evolution, but brain size is really accelerating not only across species, but within a hominid evolution, you can see how much brain size here in cubic accelerated uh, over just the last few million years, uh, really a, a tripling of, of, of brain size, while the rest of the uh, uh, anatomical characteristics have, have not nearly changed as much. Um, so presumably that's uh, relevant, but again, we don't causally know which of these are uh, actually uh, operative in, 